Hey, hello. Good to have you here. Uh, I'm Carolina. I'm working as a software engineer for Red Hat. But today I'm here not as a company representative, but just as myself, uh, as a person who started the journey with open source not so far a time ago, uh, even though my experience in IT is, a, is, a, is a bigger than that. And inspiration for that, that talk was that I haven't met much other people like me who just started. So I thought it would be valuable to share my experience and my observation, how this whole process looked like and how did I start it. I'm not very great about talking on myself, so here is just a set of uh, subjects and concepts I'm dealing on my daily basis job. I mostly work and contribute for RDO project. We are shipping RPM packages of OpenStack for CentOS. So mostly I'm doing packaging, DevOpsing, and debugging, also some coding. But let's go to the question. How did I meet open source? When I was studying IT in Wrocław, I was fascinated about networking and security. And uh, it became obvious for me that you can do it without tooling, tooling which is available for, uh, for a Linux. And tooling for Linux mostly work means that they are open source. So I did a two large students project. First was for my, my engineer project. And this is a this was a sandbox network for uh, security research and testing. And this was a kind of honeypot. I was using uh, technologies like Snort, uh, like Nmap, Kali Linux, and Security Onion. And then on my master thesis, I was uh, testing and benchmarking uh, distributed file systems. Uh, a few time ago, after I was graduated, I realized that two of the systems I was testing a Gluster and Ceph was a Red Hat project that I didn't know when I was doing my job. Of course, Ceph appears uh, best from, from all the that I tested. Then, when I initially knew some Linux tooling, and was really amazed that this wonderful tool is so powerful. It's open, it's free for everyone. And that idea was amazing for me. That's why I meant to force them. Uh, this is a large conference for uh, open source uh, in, a, uh, in a Brussels. And then I saw, saw some community from, from a closer view, and it was really amazing uh, uh, experience for me. How I didn't met open source was on students' uh, interest groups. And it's a pity that there is no any, uh, on my, at least on my university, any way to encourage people at the university when they are actually choosing their, their way or their career's path, to encourage them to go to, to, go to open source. Also, none of my friends or colleagues from studies was contributing to open source. So, you, you know, I was like lonely in this topic. Why people enter the open source? There are many reasons and they are mostly mixed. But there are some few which are most solid, let's say. Generally, people would like to gain a new skills. They are starting their, pro their new projects some new adventure to just learn a new, thi new things, and they decide to just share it with a wider range of uh, people. Also, they are starting something new because they need it for their work or for their other project, and just put it on a GitHub as an open source on a, pro uh, on a proper license. Sometimes they just need development in the desired project, so they just missing some, fe some features, or they discovered a bug which is really uh, painful for them and does that just decide to fix the job or did the feature. And that's why they appear to be uh, open source contributors. And the third way is, I would say, rare, but uh, it's, going to is, it's going to be more uh, often to be hired to contribute to open source project. And this is uh, my path of growing uh, in open source. And speaking about motivation, uh, let's say there are also some more soft, non-technical ones, like people like uh, teaching others, people like sharing the knowledge, the peop people have a need to, to, op to belonging, and all of these motivations are mixed, but it's worth to remember that most of their motivations are not materialistic. No matter what motivation stays behind, people somehow has to start the work. 
And I observed that three mandatory pillars of a good start, onboarding, mentoring, and documentation. Absolute base of start if any kind of projects, no matter if commercial or open source, is an onboarding process. For open source uh, projects, it's crucial for gaining new contributors, and for commercial one, it's providing smooth and quicker start, and also it helps to reduce stress and just make the start quicker. Shor it's good onboarding process is shortening the time when people stops to be a cost for a company and starts to actually provide the value. Because don't get me wrong here, even the best engineers are a cost at the beginning. Of course, until the time they are get into the project and get enough knowledge to provide value. Speaking about onboarding, it's also worth to mention uh, some kind of vicious circle. If we have a project where contributors or developers are overwhelmed if, uh, I with a work, they don't have a time to onboard new, new people. They don't have a time for uh, doing onboardings or the stuff. Just let me, leave me alone, I, wanna I want to just work. But if they don't pro onboard new people properly, they still have too much work because they don't have anyone to help them. That's why it's very important to have this process because it will help with it and automate some stuff for any new people. Everyone hates writing documentation, including me. But good documentation is a huge support, not only for newbies, but also for our experienced contributors and maintainers. And this is a far imp more important tool than just an opportunity to say RTFM. Think about it in more materialistic way. Uh, when there is a, when some process is undocumented, every new people who is dealing with it has to do some let's say, wheel engineering on it. And it costs a time. And time, as we said, is a cost. So if we have some, I, had, I heard a quite good description about such situation. It calls tribal knowledge. And this is a piece of undocumented uh, project, which is so obvious for a maintainer that they didn't even mention it in any kind of documentation. It can be, for example, setting a flag before an infra deployment. And you know, you just start your deployment, you are doing everything, and you are meeting all these horrible bugs which you'd never seen before, before that. And you are struggling with it. This poor newbie is spending a time, digging inside, and waste a time. Yeah, you, you know, I know that trying is a way of process and a way to grow, but you know, come on, it's pointless. This time can be spent for something more valuable. And you know, it's enough to have this flag documented. And that's why it's called tribal knowledge. Also, uh, speaking of documentation, there is uh, one important <coughs> note. Keep it up to date. Because if your documentation is outdated, people who are using it, users or newbies or new contributors, are learning that they cannot trust this documentation. And they will keep you asking anyway. And this, com this documentation is, you know, not you don't need it because it's outdated. And the third pillar of a good start is having a mentor. As a mentor, I understand the person who on a partner partnership level will show you the, the, the project, will explain you the rules, show you how the team, team, team works, but also this is a somebody who will grow you on other, mm, or in other ways than only technicals. So this is somebody who also who understands what do you like, uh, who will help you to clarify the way of uh, development you want to go as a, as a developer. Uh, the good mentor should also understand the tasks and helps to provide the proper task which will grow the newbie and which newbie will like. And uh, I have to say that I had an amazing, amazing mentor on RDO and if you will only have a possibility to find a mentor at your company, please do it, because I think that having a mentor is a kind of highway on a personal development uh, road. In all this stuff I mentioned, there is a challenges. First of them is a remote life. And if you work for corporation, you at least have some chances for, uh, for office. If you work like me, so 100% remotely, 
uh, prepare also for a remote communication and kind of remote life. I have to say that COVID helped develop the culture of remote working. In Poland, where I, when, where I work, uh, COVID showed for uh, many employers that remote working is possible, it's efficient, and people actually doing their job when they are at home. And also, I have to say that it proved it to me, because before COVID, I never thought that I had enough courage, enough self-confidence to even try to work remotely and not in a la native language. I have to say that COVID just uh, leave no choice. And speaking about language, English is a not native language for most of us, and this fact is often neglected. People are afraid of asking for repetition or just saying that they don't understand in fear of being known as incompeten incompetent. And it's good to remember when some problems or issue appeared, it may be not related to you know, technical abilities of a person or just a simple basic communication problem related to language. When I start my work at Red Hat and I get known that I will have a meetings, normal stuff. But in written, on IRC, I was so shocked. I couldn't even you know, understand how is it possible that the meetings are written. And also I thought that IRC is a communication method which appears only on XKCD MEMS, but it's still alive. <laughs> yep, and um, now from the perspective, yeah, also IRC is our official uh, channel of communication for uh, OpenStack uh, community. So I understand why we are using IRC. It has its advantages because it's very easy to use for a whole community. But that time, I was very, very, very shocked and didn't prepare for that. And uh, I have to say that Fedora did it nice way because they moved for some kind, let's say, more modern uh, communicator because they moved to Matrix, which is very, you know, nice uh, web, uh, web uh, user interface. And, you know, it's easier for, for, for anyone from outside to just use it. And challenge about communication is to just choose a platform where anyone who would like to have an influence for the project will be able to use it. Communities are relations. Communities are people. So building a relations inside the community and on a way community and uh, commercial world is very, very important. And this is a huge role of community architects to just build these relations. And events like that, events like FOSDEM are very important for the communities because, because this is a place where you actually go, meet people, exchange your experience, exchange your ideas, and that's why how community is growing. Also, this is very important to, inside this community, build a, a welcoming culture because you know you, when you are out of the communities, it's very nice, and I experienced that, that you are just welcome here. We, we are happy having to have you here. It's very, it's very good for the beginning. Also, it's very important to have a uh, safe space to ask, to not be afraid to you know, ask and, and, and grow and solve your, uh, solve your issues. Um, yeah. The governance of the project. Uh, the world of corporations and the world of open source differs. In corporate world, we have uh, words like tickets, KPIs, performance, measurements, you know it. And at the same way, they are not existing in, a op ups in, a, in open source uh, communities. It's just not the way they are working. And this is a challenge to find a way to find a balance between these two approaches. And the workflow in those projects. Uh, the way how you are making decisions, the way how you're making even the meetings, how you are sharing the tasks, all this, uh, all this issue to be solved, they cannot be the same the way in community like they are done in a corporate because voice of the community has to be taken into the account when, uh, when while making decisions or while doing just normal basic uh, duties. I have some teams for other newbies. And third, most important, 
and I fixed the surprise, just ask. Use the time we just considered as being your training or the onboarding process as your time to be, you know, safe to ask because everyone are expecting that you will be asked, that you will not know, that you will looking for an answer, looking for a solutions. And it's normal and that's okay. And you should take best of the time what you even can. Trying to ask proper and valuable questions. You have to first try to do something. So if you want to ask somebody a question, don't let anyone to answer you with, let me Google it for you, or here is a documentation, just read it. Try to avoid that because, you know, it's a waste of time. And I think kind of lack of respect. And first, just try to do the job. Okay, it's normal that you probably will faint or probably, I don't know, you stuck on something. Yeah, but you at least try, at least do some effort to solve the problem. And this is something which will uh, improve your skills. Make friends. Talk with as many people as possible because you will never know with whom you will collaborate. So this is onboard this onboarding time, this usually you know, one month or two months, it depends on the company or community, uh, is the best time to meet new people, to make new friends, like saying, hi, I'm new here, and uh, just make networking between, between people. And as I, as, uh, as I said, uh, if we only have a possibility to find a mentor, do it, because there can, they can, there can be a mentoring program in your company or in your community, com com community that you even don't even know about it. So maybe you can just ask your manager or just try to find one because you will only be profitable out of having a, having a mentor. Tips for mentors. And as I say, keep your documentation up to date. I think I argumented it quite, uh, quite enough. So I won't uh, repeat that. And again, this world of asking, but now asking from a different perspective. You know, why asking is so important? Because this is a root of communication. So people should, the, the communication should not be only in one way, should be in both ways. No matter if it's your mentor or if it's your manager, you should just exchange your communication. I know this is very trivial as I'm saying, but what I'm observing, people don't talk. So they are just, uh, sometimes they are not even aware about the problems of each others. And if you are a mentor, uh, I mean, when you are in a situation that you are, you give some tasks to your newbie, for example, read, a, uh, read this documentation uh, or uh, try this tool. After the time, ask your newbie uh, and try to figure it out. How is the level of understanding of the newbie? What did this newbie uh, got from this reading, got from this tutorial? Because this is a great way for you to understand how the newbie is looking at the project. Also, this opportunity to indicate the moments in your project which are or badly documented or unclear or just undocumented because you as a mentor probably you don't have this, uh, this perspective because they're for so long in this project that too many stuff are too obvious for you. So this is an opportunity to you to uh, have a different perspective on your project. And what's important if this asking, remember to emphasize that this is not an exam, not any kind of assessment because your newbie can feel a little bit uh, in danger in this fire of your questions. Just let them know that, you know, just I'm asking, it's not assessment. It's important because without it, your relations can be mm, distracted. <laughs> give tasks to help understand. You know, when you are not only not only give a documentation to read, but also give a small task to use this new stuff you just learned. When I was learning our DeLorean tools, our very versatile tool to for uh, building packages, I got a task. Hey, just try to build this one package with this tool, and it's completely changed my whole perspective of reading this, this documentation because I was looking for uh, some 
complete concrete informations in this, this uh, in this documentation which will allows me to allows me to solve the problem i've got and i think this is a very valuable way of teaching new stuff learning new stuff give away background uh, not only explain the solution of problem or a bug but also show how and why this happened this is an opportunity to explain the workflows and actually the architecture in the project because it's actually having an anchor if a problem because newbie meet something did some uh, some effort to solve the problem so they are inside the context so it's very easy to uh, make a note about it and explain the context around it and Hold your horses. Don't try to explain everything at the beginning because I'm sure. No, I'm sure you will have to repeat it later. And general tips for a good start for anyone: have a definition of done. This is something I really like to have. Uh, I mean that when you are describing, making a description of a tasks in some kind of tax management, uh, define input and output of the tasks in a clear way. Describe this task that way. If you are, for example, go for a holiday and someone will do the task after you, it will be totally clear for, for this person. And I think this is a, this is a good description, enough good uh, description. Don't assume that somebody uh, will understand what you meant without this description. That's why it's so important. And guessing is never an option because there is a very high probability that you will don't get what you expected. Describe the role. Um, when somebody's new is coming, uh, it's very useful to define what this person is going to do after the onboarding process. And it's like setting an aim and setting a target for whatever they did. And f f when, the new when the person will go among through this, through this uh, onboarding process, will be very sensitive for information which will be related to the job which they are going to be inside after the onboarding process. For example, let's say, if you are a mentor or a manager, let's say at the beginning, hey, we are needed a person who will be in charge of uh, developing our infra or in charge or new CI jobs. And you know, through all this onboarding, the newbie will be preparing itself for taking these re responsibilities. Show collaboration with other teams or projects. As I said, it's very useful to know where to look for help and being able to ask it, of course. Uh, and who is responsible for what? And the onboarding process is a great time for that. Time for that. And last but not least, give yourself and themselves a time. As a mentor, be patient and don't judge. People have a different way of thinking, different talents, different approaches to problem, as we are trying to build a diverse environment in our, our works. Also be ready that sometimes you will not only develop someone on a technical way or, or teach someone uh, these hard skills. Also be prepared that you will have to teach also the soft skills like uh, problem solving abilities or doing dependency or required management or just way of speaking or discussing. Be ready for that as a mentor. And if you are a newbie, don't expect that you will be great since uh, every, f every first day any first day or uh, even a uh, first month because you don't have an any idea about the complexity of the problem or the project and don't care too much about the failures because if you failed it means that you tried and trying is something which is most important for make you growing and uh, thank you very much for your attention uh, i'm here for you and i will very appreciate your feedback and if you have any questions i'm here for you Yes. Um, I'm actually about two years ago I came in, uh, hopefully to movies, and I was about to suggest writing documentation for a couple of sports in, in our project as a literally uh, beginner task. But I, I can see that being mentioned on the other hand that you should keep documenting that way. What's your opinion about that? Is that a mistake? Is it uh, is it a bad idea to because it does seem somewhat like an easy thing. Uh, 
So what, what's your feeling about that? Because you mentioned that uh, for the lender and for the project itself to have uh, like good uh, up-to-date documentation is actually the better thing to have. And you mean by giving a task for making documentation up-to-date, yes? Yes, actually not up-to-date in this case. We have a couple of tools in uh, okay. our okay. in our, uh, in our library. Okay, so the question is if it's good to give a task for a newbie to fill some gaps in your documentation, right? Huh. I've got some, uh, I've got a task for that. And yes, I think this is a good task, but don't uh, be too, mm, too difficult in that. <laughs> don't give somebody a task to explain something which you don't really understand. Right. But I think it's a, it's a good idea for start. Yes? Um, so you mentioned this, uh, like trying to solve the problem by yourself before going or asking for help, you know, reading the documentation and so on. Where would you say is the borderline? Like when, as a, as a newbie, when I should start trying to resolve it and go ask for help? Okay. Uh, the question was uh, where to stop, when to stop digging inside the, the project and stop trying to do yourself and actually ask for help. Uh, well, uh, I've got this issue on my, uh, on my previous job that try to do it, but don't too much. Uh, and I heard from my manager that, you know, it's up to you. This onboarding process is for you and you will decide when you want to stop and move to asking before because your manager or mentor is not inside your head and they not don't know where you are, when is the moment you feel frustrated or you feel, feel stuck. It's up to you. If you feel that this few more four hours will solve the problem, go get it. Uh, it's onboarding process, so nobody will know. Uh, track your hours in Jira, or at, at least should not do it. Uh, but if you are feel stuck and you feel stuck that even these two days more will not solve the problem, just leave it. Just ask because it's a waste of time and your energy. Okay, uh, I have no idea how to make your question short <laughs> for a <laughs> recording. Uh, I, I, I try to understand with a context. So remember that the programs you are saying about, like this G Cloud, yes, these are big corporations. And most people, what I was thinking about open source, you know, is, is this, this small initiative is, is just like, I will start and do it. Or, uh, you know, Google is not, widely recognized as an open source company. Maybe let's say Fedora is, because even though it's the same also uh, the supported and uh, sponsored by Red Hat. And I would say people who are, uh, have a clear idea of joining open source, they will not first think it will not be Google or programs of a big, co big, big corporations. And from the other side, from a smaller projects, it's very high, hard for me, at least, to find this way to join. Also, this is uh, another, uh, another, another thread here that people, for example, I mean, I, wasn't, uh, I wouldn't believe that I can handle the tasks in totally remotely without not knowing people and just, you know, using my keyboards to solve the problem and actually providing a value. So maybe I think people, this is a mixed 
because people doesn't recognize uh, Google or other, uh, maybe Red Hat, well, Red Hat not, <laughs> but other big companies as a open source uh, uh, mm, possibility. Uh, and from the other side, they don't have a very easy way to start with smaller projects. It's, it's changing. I have to say, since I, I joined, I have to say that it's ch changing. I think that, for example, there's a lot of mm, programs to start, as you're saying. But I think this is a, this is a way, matter of time to, to change it, but people are aware that inside open source that they need newbies. And I think this is an important change here. Yes, it may be branding. Because Google Summer of Code, to make it clear, is not a program during which people work for Google. So I, as you know, owner of an open source project not related to any company, it can be my own startup, which is upstream, I can have a project in Google Summer of Code during which I need a student to contribute to my project. But you have a Google in the name. Exactly. So can it be that it's purely about branding of this program? Yes, it can be. Yeah. If you know, if we rename the Google Summer of Code to something, something Summer of Code, like you know, open source Summer of Code. Of course, they won't agree, but just an idea. You know, if people, if if someone is here, for example, program for Open BSD, it's very clear that it is open source. But if you hear Google Summer of Code, you understand. I think we have all for time. Okay. 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 Come to me after. Uh, thank you.